All right, um, I think we can get started. I understand some of, your, some of your friends are studying hard for the exams and, and are missing this one. So they will have to compensate with extra effort to, for losses of having this uh, discussion today. Um, we started last Friday talking about Iran's nuclear program. This is a very wide-ranging issue and I will go almost all of the slides that I used back in 2006 and since then not much has changed as I mentioned last time and I will try to be as explicit as possible about every single step uh, that have paved the way uh, that has paved the way to what we are now facing uh, currently because uh, the Iranian nuclear program is still uh, dominating the international political arena in terms of security implications, political implications, economic implications, etc. So it is necessary for us to understand very well what has happened in the past, what has happened recently, and what, what is happening today, and what is likely to happen in the future. Because, as I said, Iranian nuclear program is not a, a simple issue, it has many facets, it has many dimensions, each of which needs to be fully elaborated and comprehensively discussed for you to better understand because this is a whole new subject for those who have not been familiar with the nuclear proliferation related issues and I don't think uh, many of you have had any such acquaintance or just any uh, uh, knowledge beforehand. I was talking last time about this Atoms for Peace speech of the US President uh, Eisenhower and I had explained as to why the United States President felt the need to deliver a speech at the United Nations General Assembly meeting. The date was 8th of December 1953 um, and it is significant in that right after the uh, detonation of uh, two atomic bombs on top of Japan which paved the way to the termination of war, the Second World War, World War II, first with Japan. And, and so, and then of course uh, since then Japanese-American relations uh, have improved very much. And prior to that Japan was an imperial power and was the dominating power um, in the Far East and South Pacific to a great extent. Anyway, so having seen the disastrous effects of the nuclear weapons, the United States proposed to other nations, primarily to the Soviet Union, to give up any work on further development of nuclear weapons, also promising that itself was not or would not go to develop any uh, weapons uh, in the future. But the Soviets did not welcome this idea on the grounds that the and they, they, they put forward arguments such as knowledge cannot be disinvented, you cannot put the genie back in the, into the bottle, and therefore you have now this knowledge as to how to develop nuclear weapons. You have the material, scientific, technological skills, and other things that are necessary to assemble a device. Since you have developed this weapon once, you can develop in the future, even if we commit ourselves not to develop these weapons and even if you commit yourself not to develop these weapons how can we make sure that in the future in the in the next US administrations no president will ever contemplate of developing these weapons so the Soviets did not agree to the proposal uh, put forward by the United States to quit developing uh, further um, uh, weapons and then they themselves developed um, uh, the, the first Soviet bomb in 1949 uh, and in those years, of course, uh, there were other countries which had advanced scientific knowledge, theoretical work, and also some uh, technological uh, advances in the nuclear field. And nuclear energy, as I said, has two facets, has two faces, one of which is benign and the other is malign. I mean, good and bad, two faces of nuclear energy. 
like many other technological innovations, of course, in, in the hands of for benign purposes, for uh, positive purpose, purposes, nuclear energy can be a, a, a large source of energy generation, electricity. Uh, it has applications in agriculture, in the, in the health sector, medical sector, etc. So uh, many countries, especially the advanced countries in the West, have embarked upon fast developing these technologies and also share this technology by way of selling to other countries because it was a, a going at a very good price. But because of the uh, possibly the psychological as well as political impact of having used this weapon against humans in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States felt at that time the moral obligation to not to share this technology with other countries with a view to prevent other countries from developing the weapon. And therefore put uh, limitations on its own companies, on, on, on its own government, not to allow sharing this technology with other countries. And therefore there was this 1947 uh, Atomic Energy Act which prevented the US firms from entering into contractual agreements with other countries, other companies, which of course uh, have been negatively affected because European companies, Canadian firms were uh, selling this technology to other countries already. And therefore the United States again this time uh, decided uh, to lift this embargo towards its own uh, firms, its own companies, and to allow the American firms also to enter the market and uh, to be competitive in this market. But of course, the United States wanted to sort of bring certain regulations to the nuclear market. At that time, there was no uh, regulations or there were no uh, sets of procedures which would regulate as to whom should buy or who, whom could buy or sell this technology or for under what conditions. So the Atoms for Peace speech actually was uh, the message to the world by the U United States that the United States was ready to share this technology provided that countries that would acquire this technology, that would transfer this technology would make a commitment, would commit themselves not to exploit for purposes other than mentioned in the contract. That is, they would only uh, use this technology for energy gen generation or applications in the agriculture or medicine or medical sector. So um, this Atoms for Peace speech in a sense opened the way to the uh, entry of the U.S. firms into the international market. And since then the U.S. government itself also um, gave a lot of support to the American firms uh, in, in terms of uh, selling this technology in order to have this um, competitive edge, competitive advantage in the market. Of course, one reason was maybe to um, provide some advantages for, for the American firms. But another reason was, of course, uh, something that may not have been pronounced explicitly, uh, was to um, uh, have a say on the development of nuclear capabilities of other countries. Because if the United States would be the provider, supplier of nuclear technology, of course the United States would itself have the ability to control as to how that technology would be used in that particular country that would have bought this uh, technology from the United States. If other countries sold that technology to countries of concern or uh, whose um, uh, ambitions would create some question marks, the United States would not have any control on that. For instance, when Canada sold the Condor reactors to India, of course it was the Canadian government and the Canadian firm that would have any control about how that technology would be used. But if the United States or US firms sold that technology, the United States would have first-hand information from the country, from the facility in which that technology would be used. So uh, therefore that was also another reason why the US uh, president delivered such a speech which is a famous speech known as the Atoms for Peace speech. So um, in the 1950s, the United States, as I said, uh, provided encouragements to other states, especially and primarily to, to its allies, uh, countries like Turkey, countries like Iran, 
which of course had close relations with the United States uh, in, within a strategic context. Just remember the uh, first and foremost ambition or just expectation of foreign policy priority of the United States was to contain the Soviet Union. So as part of the containment policy, Turkey and Greece were included in the uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and Iran was, of course, outside of NATO, but there was also a special arrangement between uh, Turkey and Iran as well as uh, uh, Pakistan, which aimed at providing a belt uh, in order to contain the further Soviet expansion and, and sort of prevent them from reaching uh, to the Middle East and to the Indian Ocean. So within this context, the Iranian Shah, uh, not only in the 50s, but also throughout the 60s and 70s, as well as 80s, uh, Iran, uh, in a sense, wanted to exploit this situation. I mean, uh, during the Shah period, I mean, the Shah was somewhat, uh, uh, according to some observers, was overemphasizing uh, the significance of its uh, country and also overestimating the threats. And uh, some American observers, including the uh, U.S. presidents as well, have uh, in their messages to the Shah uh, tried to uh, remind him that the threats that he perceived uh, were not necessarily as significant as he deemed to be uh, important or significant and that he would uh, uh, be better off if he uh, invested more in economic development at the social sort of uh, uh, development uh, issues. But of course uh, from the Shah's perspective first and foremost uh, the most important thing was the security of the country and he was concerned about Nasserism which was uh, gaining a lot of uh, support within the Arab uh, countries, among the Arab uh, uh, streets. And also uh, the Russian threat, the Soviet threat was there. So the Shah's uh, considerations about security were uh, not necessarily compatible with those of uh, the United States. Anyway, uh, in the 60s uh, and also in the 70s, we have seen a steady increase in the interest of the Shah and Iran as a whole in nuclear technology. But uh, it is not possible to talk uh, about any significant uh, or quantum leap until 19, 1974. What happened in 1974 was, of course, uh, very significant, which was the oil uh, prices crisis, um, the, the OPEC crisis, which resulted in the increased steep rise of the uh, oil prices uh, some four times or so and over a short period of time the Shah uh, actually found itself himself uh, his country uh, in, in, uh, in large sums of money so yes until then Iran was uh, getting significant revenues from oil and gas and primarily oil gas was not of that much use at the time as it is the case today. Of course it was, but not as much as today. But oil, uh, with the increase, of, uh, increase in prices of oil four times within a very short span of time, uh, there was a huge influx of money coming uh, and huge revenues due to oil uh, prices, oil exports. So after that, uh, the Shah took a very radical decision and, and in a sense elevated, uh, uh, raised his expectations and uh, set his ambitions very high, which was to build uh, or establish 20,000 megawatt electric uh, within the following 20 years. So had Shah's plans been uh, accomplished by 1994, I mean 74 plus 20 years makes 1994, Iran should have had actually 20,000 or so megawatt electric established a nuclear power infrastructure. What, what does this mean? 20,000 megawatt may not mean too much. Well, big power reactors, of course, in the past 600 megawatt or 800 megawatts uh, were big, large nuclear reactors for energy generation. But nowadays, 1,300, I mean, 1,300, 1,500, uh, or so, or 1,400 megawatt, uh, a, a reactor, it's a big reactor which can uh, uh, generate large sums of electricity, large amounts of electricity. 
So therefore, 20,000 megawatt electric uh, is something in between 18 to 25 or so nuclear reactors. I mean, today Iran, as of today, uh, November 9th, 2010 has only one operating reactor, which is 1,000 megawatt. So uh, that may tell something about how big uh, uh, was the ambition of the Shah back in 1974. And we know from uh, the writings of then uh, head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, in his writing, he, he says that the budget of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran was increased from $1 million to $1 billion. So there is a thousand times increase in the budget after this uh, uh, you know, long-term expectations, long-term ambitions. So this is something which was significant in that once a country declares to the world its intention to build large number of uh, uh, nuclear reactors. Of course, many countries, many supplier firms and countries want to take uh, their own share from it. So therefore, German firms, French firms, as well as uh, American firms have competed with one another and they, they made sort of uh, proposed bids uh, and they, they proposed to the Iranian government uh, projects to install large power reactors. And uh, German firm uh, Siemens and KVU, Kraftwerk Union, uh, uh, proposed and started to build two times 1.3 or 1,300 megawatt electric in Boucher. So uh, it was the Siemens, <laughs> Siemens, Kraftwerk Union. Firm. So that was the German firms bid and eventually started the construction in the second half of the 1970s and by the time of the Islamic Revolution in 1979 uh, a significant proportion of the at least the construction and the buildings uh, was said to be complete I mean in two reactors one of which was according to different reports and the for, uh, information that we get from various sources, some 80% and 60% of the reactors, the construction, not the sort of technological parts or technical parts, but the, the mere uh, physical construction, they say, uh, was uh, completed by the time of the revolution, which, uh, or a significant, again, proportion of which was later on destroyed during the Iran-Iraq war. Well, that's a different story that we'll be talking about. But, so. In order to understand, and there was also the French firm which was about to uh, build another sort of in Darkovin, so region. So uh, these were the nuclear uh, power reactors which were uh, agreed by Iran to build uh, or to let the French and the German firms to build. And the United States also wanted to take its own share by building the reactors. And more specifically, and more importantly, and also more interestingly, to build two other facilities, one of which would be enrichment, and the other would be reprocessing. So these are two very strategically important facilities. A nuclear reactor is a, uh, is, is a sort of a mechanism by means of which you generate electricity. Actually, the principle is very simple. You either have uh, uh, I mean, nuclear fuel to boil the water and to sort of create just uh, large sums of large amounts of uh, uh, vapor, which when you force into the turbines, the turbines turn and they generate electricity. If you put coal or other sort of, uh, or natural gas, then you can still boil the water, have the vapor, turn the turbines, and get the electricity. So therefore, the nuclear reactors themselves are just mechanisms of generating electricity. I mean, so the, re the reactor, the core of the reactor, or the reactor itself, uh, does not have any direct significance for weapons manufacturing in the nuclear field. What has significance is actually 
and rich uranium or repossessed uh, uh, uranium, which actually is plutonium. So therefore, uh, reactors may be uh, somehow misinterpreted or misunderstood by men in the street, by ordinary person, as if one can generate or build bomb within the reactor. There's no such thing as building a bomb in the reactors. Reactors just consume uh, uh, low enriched uranium or natural uranium, depending on the type or sorry, size of the reactor, and they just generate electricity. But their significance for military purposes or nuclear weapons uh, comes from the enrichment facilities or reprocessing facilities that are attached to the nuclear program, nuclear energy generation program. So this aspect of enrichment and reprocessing dimensions of the uh, big picture, I mean, uh, this, these two elements make nuclear technology or nuclear power reactors or nuclear programs significant. Reactors themselves are no different than any other uh, sort of medium by means of which you generate electricity. There is nothing can be produced in the uh, nuclear reactor other than plutonium, which has to be reprocessed. I mean, you have to take from the core, uh, immerse in, uh, in, in water, let it uh, cool down for like about a year, and then you apply some chemical process by means of which you get, you extract the plutonium which is produced in the reactor field. So I'll explain this in as simple manner as possible because without proper understanding or schematic uh, understanding of this, it may not be possible to advance any further. I mean, I'll come to that uh, in this point. But what is important here is uh, in 1974, the Shah, although some Iranians, and according to some uh, records, uh, also the Shah himself denied to have such ambitions. Um, Iran Shah is on the records, or is said to be reportedly on the records for having set his ambition as high as 20 megawatt, uh, uh, 20,000 megawatt electric within the following 20 years. And again, according to some reports, we understand that it was an American uh, firm, a uh, consultancy firm, Stanford, uh, from Stanford University, I guess, um, which pro primarily proposed 23,000 megawatt, and for some reason there was this adjustment to 20 megawatt, 20,000 megawatt electric within the next 20 years, maybe to uh, capture the minds of large uh, populations with an easy figure like 20,000 megawatt within 20 years. So anyway, that was the ambition. The firm, German, French firms have set on building these reactors. United States uh, also, American firms also wanted to enter into the market. And also, again, as I said, most, more specifically and most interestingly, the U.S. Uh, president, Jimmy Carter, spent the uh, New Year's Eve in Tehran together with the Shah and in order to sell these technologies uh, in 78, 70, uh, 77, 78 uh, sort of a New Year's turn. So uh, that is significant. I'm, I'm repeating this a couple of times because what we are facing today is the U.S. demands from the United States to stop enrichment. Hopefully, for the time being, Iran is not doing reprocessing, as far as we know, other than some laboratory-scale work on the processing, which was reportedly being made uh, several years ago. But the, the problem at the core of the problem today is the enrichment capability as well as enrichment uh, work uh, in, in Iran, um, which is, of course, not very much welcome uh, by the United States and other countries uh, in, in Europe as well as Israel. So this is something that we will have to elaborate as to who is right, who is wrong, or what is right, what is wrong, because it is not always possible to uh, decide what is right and what is wrong, or there, or there is not one single right or wrong, which is a complex situation. Of course, then, uh, came the Islamic Revolution in 1979 and the war with Iran. So um, it, 
1979, when Khomeini returned to Tehran from France, from Paris, where he was living for uh, quite, quite, uh, quite a long time, and then re uh, the revolution uh, took its own pace, and over time, within a year or so, uh, things have settled uh, uh, to a large extent, not entirely, but uh, from 1979, February onwards, within about a year or so, the Islamic Revolution was almost settled in Iran. And Khomeini was the only uh, leader, spiritual leader, also, as well as political leader, I mean, in many respects. And his approach to a uh, nuclear uh, project was very negative. Many might think that uh, the Khomeini's approach might have been uh, uh, sort of uh, appreciative of what has been done in the past. No, he said, uh, and he didn't like the, the, the fact that these nuclear reactors were being built by uh, French and German firms, as well as American firms were you know, uh, doing certain things in the Tehran research reactor, uh, the five megawatt, very small, which is very uh, identical to the one that we have in uh, Chekmeje uh, Nuclear Research Center in Istanbul, uh, which came to Turkey almost at the uh, same time in the 50s, 60s, uh, and, and work was carried on since then with very much uh, for research purpose anyway. Uh, Khomeini's position was actually these technologies uh, would make Iran dependent on, on the West, and therefore he wanted the, uh, the French-German uh, sort of uh, built uh, reactors, no matter at what, at which level they were at the time, to be uh, sort of left alone. And they, he did not let the continuation of the reactors by the uh, Western companies. Actually, after the Islamic Revolution, uh, there was a period of pause. I mean, uh, the, the German and French firms and German and French governments didn't know what exactly to do. Uh, they didn't know whether they should continue with the construction, which was, uh, of course, opposed by Humani himself, because the motto was neither East nor West, only the Islamic Revolution, or is Iran, uh, Jum Jum Iranian Islamic uh, Republic. So, uh, therefore, there, were, there was this hesitation period for about a year or so, and at that time, the uh, American uh, government, of course, put a lot of pressure on German and French governments not to go ahead with the construction of the reactors that they had started to build. So uh, in the meantime, of course, uh, Iran had also shares in the uranium enrichment uh, company, which was, of course, partly owned by the French. Uh, and therefore, there was this you know, uh, contradiction between France and Iran, etc. So, in uh, 1979 and onwards, we did not see much, uh, actually nothing, in the name of uh, reactor construction. Soon after, uh, he, the war with Iraq started, and uh, Saddam Hussein, considering that he would take advantage of the situation, attacked Iran, and the war, the eight-year war, started. And during the war, of course, Iran had to assign priority to other issues, I mean, to military issues, security issues. And in the meantime, during some of the air raids by Iraqi uh, airplanes, Bush Air was also hit uh, several times. There is uh, a record, uh, some, some uh, scholars, researchers have conducted their research about when and how many times the Bush Air reactor was hit. After all, uh, it is significant because it was not complete and what was complete, or 80 or 60 percent complete, was also destroyed partially during the war. So, therefore, the 1980s did not witness anything in the name of nuclear energy program, nuclear program of Iran, because they, could, they themselves were not able to continue the projects, and there was the state of war with Iraq, and that their facilities were being hit by the Iraqi airplanes, etc., etc. Of course, things have changed uh, in due course because uh, Khomeini, who was from the beginning, from the onset, was adamantly opposing the continuation of Western projects, be it nuclear or otherwise, 
uh, he was eventually convinced by Rafsanjani and Musawi. Musawi is, uh, you might know from uh, the most recent elections last year, uh, he was uh, the so-called leader of the green movement in Iran. Uh, how green or how li liberal, it's uh, open to debate, but at least uh, a contender, an opponent uh, of uh, Medinejad uh, today. So, but uh, at that time, uh, uh, Rafsanjani convinced Khomeini that it would be in Iran's interest to continue the nuclear project. And if Iran uh, had developed nuclear capability, it might have been a, a significant deterrent against other countries. And during that war, Iran was facing some energy shortages, even though Iran is a uh, country which is very rich in oil resources. It did not have enough refineries, or the refineries that it, he, uh, Iran had were not able to operate at a full scale because of the war. And after all, during the war, you, your consumption of energy, oil, and everything increases. And therefore, Khomeini was convinced that uh, nuclear projects should continue. And this is something that we understand, again, from some records and also from uh, my conversations with Iranian scholars, experts, and statesmen, politicians, diplomats during my visit, uh, visits to this country in 2004 and 2005. So as I said, in, mid, in the mid-1980s, Khomeini gave his, his blessing to Rafsanjani for the continuation of the nuclear project. Of course, that was not, or the continuation of the project was not only dependent on what uh, Khomeini's decision. Once Khomeini made his decision to continue with the project, of course, he needed uh, partners, other countries who would um, continue the project and finish the job, which was, of course, not very easy. Because United, Iran, first of all, uh, knocked on the doors of the French and the uh, German firms and asked from them to complete the job, which was incomplete, which was left uh, uh, incomplete because of the uh, revolution and the war that followed. Of course, there was, that was uh, sort of also a period of hesitation and German and French firms, of course, uh, they could not uh, operate independent of their governments and independent of the conjunctural situation and the United States was putting a lot of pressure on the governments, the French and German governments, not to let their firms to continue with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, construction of the re uh, reactors. So um, since uh, Iran, or when Iran understood that there was uh, no hope for the French and German companies to continue with the construction of the Boucher and Darkovin, then they asked from other countries, extending from uh, Sweden uh, to India, almost and Argentina and other countries which were known as having some you know, work with uh, nuclear projects. And none of them uh, agreed eventually. And there was one common theme, something uh, very common in the demands of the Iranian government, which was in addition to the uh, completion of the construction which was left uncompleted um, by the French and Germans, especially the German Boucher, Iran also asked from the governments during this, these negotiations with the Argentine or Brazilian or Swedish or Indian firms or uh, governments, um, sending their students, Iranian students, to these countries for education and training. So, f I mean, as I said, for especially under the pressure of the United States and for some other reasons, none of these negotiations uh, proved to be fruitful. I mean, none of them uh, had any uh, result, and therefore Iran had nothing uh, but to wait. Um, toward the end of the 1980s, Rafsanjan and Gorbachev are known for uh, talking about this issue as well, among other things, among other political issues. And Gorbachev is also uh, said to have agreed for the completion of the nuclear uh, project, which was not completed by the Germans. But 
soon after, that was in 1989, and soon after the Soviet Union and Gorbachev uh, himself found themselves in trouble, and Gorbachev could not stay in power, and then, uh, of course, Yeltsin came to power after this uh, kind of coup or revolution. And the Russian Federation, of course, was primarily dealing with its own problems, putting things in order in the early 1990s. But yet, uh, Iran did not give up its ambition, its desire to go ahead with the nuclear project. And soon after, Yeltsin, uh, uh, I think uh, that was in 1992, the first agreement was signed between Iran and Russia in 1992 to, uh, for the completion of the project which eventually uh, signed into a contract in January 1995. And according to this contract, which I had a chance to see its translation, not the original one, but uh, the content, and this issue struck uh, my attention. 20 or 30, uh, 30 students every year would be sent to Russian institutions for masters, especially PhD studies, doctoral studies. So that, that was an interesting point because a country like Iran, which went at first glance and, and a very maybe uh, superficial interpretation uh, and, and uh, overall sort of assessment, I mean, one might ask the question, why, first of all, a country which is the second and third largest uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, owners of or, uh, or big reserves, the largest reserves of uh, oil and gas in the world after Saudi Arabia and Iraq or Russia, etc. Why would they need nuclear energy? This is the question that many people ask and we'll talk about it later on. And also, in addition to that, why would a country like Iran like to send 30 students every year to Russian institutions for pursuing uh, doctoral studies? So this is something that tells us that Iran, from the beginning, wanted to have, or to stand its own fit, wanted to have a self-sufficient nuclear capability, not only in terms of technological sort of assets, like nuclear reactors and some facilities, but also the scientific knowledge and accumulation that will be self-sufficient uh, for advancing or developing its own indigenous capabilities over time. So back in 1995, when Iran and Russia agreed to, for the completion of the uh, Bushehr nuclear reactor, instead of this, the Russian firm would build two times 1,000 megawatt electric uh, nuclear reactors in, in Bushehr, and one of which just started operation this past August. And there was also some technical failures because of some hacking. Uh, and, well, that was an also an interesting point. But anyway, in 1995, Russia agreed to finish by the year 2000 the first unit at least, and soon after the second unit. And the first unit came into operation only in 2010 with some 10 years of delay. And, of course, this delay is not only due to technical reasons, but also some, uh, due to some political reasons that we'll be talking about. So, therefore, this is uh, something that is important. And according to the agreement uh, signed, the contract signed with uh, Russia, Iran uh, would have uh, so many students to be sent. Well, it says here to date, which was in 2006, and that was the... Uh, information that I got back in two, March 2005 uh, during, uh, from an Iranian uh, official, an authority, someone who was in charge of these uh, people, and he said to me that there were approximately 430 or 450 uh, uh, Iranian uh, scientists with doctoral deg degrees, and 250 of them received their degrees from Russian institutions, and that was between 95 and 2005. And since then, since 2005, of course, this figure must have increased. Uh, I don't know uh, to what figure, but must still be at least maybe another hundred of them uh, might have received their PhD degrees in nuclear physics, nuclear engineering, 
and other sort of uh, scientific uh, degrees uh, that might be significant for nuclear project. Ibrahim, question? Yes. Yeah. With the laws of Cold War, the rules of Cold War, Russia wants to wants to need a lie. This agreement make need a lie against the United States. Yeah. The the question is, what was the motive behind uh, uh, such a deal from Russia's perspective? The motivation for Iran is clear. Iran wants to complete its nuclear program, which it uh, started uh, back in the uh, mid-70s. But from Russia's perspective, of course, there are many reasons, one of which would be possibly the financial issue, because the deal would, uh, was said to be about a billion dollars. Some even said $800 million, or well, something in between. So uh, approximately a billion dollars for Russia at the time in, uh, in the early 1990s, when the economy was in, in a very difficult shape, very difficult condition, of course, and that would make sense. But of course, Russia is such a big country that would not only do something uh, just for one billion dollars. Well, that was a significant, f a significant figure for that period of time, but a billion dollars in itself would not be explaining the situation. Another reason, at least uh, something that I think might be one of the important uh, motivations for Russia to agree, first of all, we should bear in mind that no other country could agree to complete the project because of the pressure of the United States on these countries, uh, be it Argentina or European countries or India, etc. Or they may have had their own different uh, interpretations. But Russia, even though you know, the Soviet Union collapsed, well, in your terms, Russia or Soviet Union lost the Cold War, but still Russia was significant for the United States and important for the United States because of the existence of hundreds, indeed thousands of nuclear weapons and hundreds of tons of chemical weapons, biological agents, material that can be weaponized, missiles. So Russia was the world's largest weapons arsenal. And the authority on top of this sort of a weapons arsenal was to a certain extent collapse. But of course, the, the Russians have done their best to not to lose control on their nuclear weapons and also on some significant strategic weapons. So United States was also helping Russia uh, uh, within the context of the Cooperative Trade Reduction Program, which is also no, n known as Nal Nugur Program, uh, and was pouring billions of dollars to Russia in order to keep these weapons safe and secure in their proper places. Not only the weapons and material, but also scientific knowledge and technology was important. And th th hundreds of millions of dollars were spent for scientists to remain in Russia, not to go to countries like Iran, Libya, Korea, etc. So Russia was in a very close cooperation with the United States, and the United States was paying a lot of attention to its relations with Russia. So, of course, it had a leverage on Russia, but it could not pressurize on Russia beyond a certain limit. So, therefore, Russia had this capability to stand against U.S. pressure, but on the other hand, of course, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia had certain vulnerabilities, such as the former Soviet republics, many of which had common denominators with Iran. And in the early 1990s, one of the major concerns of the West was who would lead these former Soviet republics in Central Asia and Caucasus, whether it would be Turkey or which model they would follow. And the West did not want the former Soviet republics in Central Asia and Caucasus to follow the lead of Iran. And Russia also was very much concerned about whether Iran would do something in its backyard. So in my opinion, of course, the Russians may not agree this openly, but this is something that I strongly believe. 
in Russia, by giving this technology to Iran, in a sense, uh, controlled Iran's ambitions and prevented Iran from meddling in, the, in its Russia's backyard in Central Asia. So, in a sense, that was a, uh, something that kept Iran away from Russia's backyard in Central Asia. So, okay, I'm giving you nuclear technology that you want the most, but don't do anything wrong that would jeopardize my security situation and my interest in, in, in my backyard in Central Asia in Caucasus. So Iran said, okay, you give me technology, I don't do anything in, in Central Asia. So there was this, some sort of a tacit agreement. But if you ask an Iranian diplomat or Russian diplomat, they will say, no, there is no such thing. But this is their job to say. All right, let's give a break, and we will continue later on.